Watch this. Change can be tough. And that difficulty was on full display this legislative session when JFAC tried a new way of doing things. Oh, there was resistance, but it was futile. Or was it? Could we see more changes to Idaho's budget process? A change to how Idaho voters identify themselves made two advocacy groups resist with a lawsuit, and the highest court in the state sent them home. The historic Rice House in Caldwell is making some changes by changing its location. It's moving to a different neighborhood, sort of like this historic house in Boise did 18 years ago. We only look at 19% of the total budget on average every year. And this new method would allow us in the interim between sessions to dive down into the base budgets and really keep these two pieces separate. We've chronicled the change of method JFAC began using this legislative session. The idea was to pass maintenance budget, something to cover the basics, maybe mirror the previous year's request with a cost of living increase included. Then the budget committee would come back with supplemental budgets, replacements, which would include new items and requests. The point was to kind of streamline the process, but at the same time give lawmakers more time to consider baseline budgets throughout the year, as you heard Senator Herndon say. And you also heard him say, this is better than just rubber stamping 81% of budgets year over year. But there was some concern from those who wanted things to stay the same. And there was an issue during the session over whether there might be a coup in JFAC to do that. Well, there wasn't. So now that it's over, is the new process here to stay? Joe Paris spoke to one of the chairs to find out. In terms of responsibilities at the State House, Idaho's budgeting committee is probably near the top of the list. But a new process heading into the session had some worried. Now the dust has settled on 2024. I am really excited about what happened. Idaho Falls Representative Wendy Horman co-chairs the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee with Eagle Senator Scott Grow. Chair Horman believes the new process worked. We had better transparency than we've ever had before between our website and separating the base budgets from the growth budgets. We really have put into place a process where it's a building block. We, we have greater transparency and accountability now, compliance with how the money is supposed to be spent. But in the summer, we'll be looking at what's in the base. As a part of the new process, lawmakers will be digging into base budgets to make sure money is being spent correctly and effectively. We've given you money in the past for X. Did you do X? And did you get outcome Y that you said you would? And so we passed some legislation this year that will create a new uh, division in LSO called Legislative Impact Reviews. So we'll be moving in the direction of performance-based budgeting. There were critics of the processes who worried that it wouldn't really work or it wasn't fully cooked. Democrats raised a flag on the process all the way back in January. Still have no confidence that there's not any errors in there now. I'm sure there are. I don't think they're maintenance budgets. They're not what we had last year, which to me that would be a maintenance budget and then then it's kind of being said that we'll go back and look at the line items and replacement issues but uh, non-discretionary items weren't put in there were some reappropriation bills that weren't put in so did the critics have a point in the end in my opinion no we didn't lose a single budget on the house floor this year you know historically it's been the house that's had trouble passing budgets this year it was the senate and they did lose a couple of budgets. We almost did in the House, but we didn't. So I think a lot of the fears that uh, were existed at the beginning of session, I, I hope have been put to rest that this is an authentic process to increase transparency and accountability for taxpayer funds. That's what we've done, and we're going to continue to do more of it. Late in the session, in relation to the ITD budget, which included language to end a sale of the ITD Boise campus, there was a major JFAC question. Was the budgeting committee setting policy in an inappropriate way? Earlier this session, it was made very clear that this is a budget committee, not a policy committee. And yet here we are ramming a piece of policy into a budget. In my opinion, your fiscal policy is your policy. And that's the job of this committee is to set fiscal policy. So anytime we put uh, restrictions or direction on how the money is to be used, that's our job. And that's what we did with ITD. So if we were going to start a new program, and you know, that should happen in a policy committee. But for JFAC to say uh, 
here are the conditions on using the funds. That's exactly why the taxpayer sent us here. So to answer Brian's question at the top of the story, the answer is yes, the process is in place and will continue. We will follow that through the summer. Uh, thank you to Chair Horman and Chair Grove for walking us through the process through the entire session and through the summer, through the interim. We'll be following some of that dive down into the base budgets as well, Brian. But it wasn't without issues, as we Correct. heard toward the end. The vocational rehab thing, how did that turn out? So the vocational rehab situation was something we uh, reported on in terms of it came clear at the, at the end of the session that this uh, agency in Idaho, they, they didn't have the money in their budget to be paying all the vendors that had services rendered and there was an accounting issue and there's some type of an issue that has not been solved yet but uh, uh, chair Horman actually told me this morning and I asked her she said this has been solved for now there is a solution to make sure that the vendors are getting paid through the end of the year but Brian lawmakers they will be coming back in January okay. to take a look at the vocational rehab situation again lawmakers didn't want to pu punish the people that get the services from the state at the same time, though, it does involve giving more money. And it can wait till January. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Well, student IDs are no longer a legal form of identity to vote in Idaho. We knew this based on bills that became law last year. But now the Idaho Supreme Court has agreed with the laws and turned away a challenge by voter advocacy group Babe Vote and the League of Women Voters. Justices went along with a district court's ruling in a unanimous decision, saying the new laws were not overly burdensome to voters. The voter groups sued the Secretary of State over House Bills 124 and 340 from last session, which removed the option of a student ID to register to vote or as a proof of who you are at the polls. Ada County judge dismissed the case last October, so it was appealed, and now the state Supreme Court agreed, saying every voting rule basically imposes some sort of burden, but these two don't rise to the level of voter suppression. Today, Secretary of State Phil McGrain responded to the news saying our office looks forward to collaborating with the League of Women Voters and Babe Vote to encourage more Idahoans to register and actively participate in the upcoming May primary and the November 5th general elections. Idaho Attorney General Raul Labrador also happy with the ruling. Said in part, Idaho legislature took steps to improve our election security, but rather than encouraging young people to obtain their free state voter IDs, well, these groups took legal action against the state alleging age discrimination. Abby Davis spoke to the plaintiffs, Abby Bay Vote spoke to them today, and they told her they are crushed by this decision, believing it goes against the fundamental right to vote. They said they won't stop fighting against laws like these. And you can hear more from Bay Vote and the Secretary of State's office tonight, coming up on the news at 10. Got a lot of comments yesterday after the governor signed the harmful materials in library bill, including one from Boise Mayor Lauren McLean. Joe Paris tells us what she has to say, along with a few other bits of news in today's 411. I believe that Alex Collins was better shooting him in demo. Detective Ray Hermosillo with the Rexburg Police Department was back on the stand in day two of the triple murder trial of Chad Daybell. He's accused of murder and conspiracy in the deaths of his late wife, Tammy Daybell, and his current wife's two children, JJ and Tylee. Detective Hermosillo was at Chad's property in June of 2020 when investigators found the remains of Tylee and JJ. He described what they saw and smelled that day. Then the defense began their cross-examination of Detective Hermosillo. They asked about multiple attempted shootings aimed at Tammy and Lori Vallow's niece's ex-husband, Brandon Boudreaux. Police believe that Lori's brother, Alex Cox, was the shooter. The defense says he plans on re-examining Hermosillo later in the trial. Court will resume on Monday. Boise Mayor Lauren McLean is reacting to Governor Little signing the harmful materials in the library bill just yesterday. This new bill, now law, it gives parents the means to file a complaint with the library about a book they find objectionable in a kid's section. The library has 60 days to relocate said book, or if they believe it in the proper section, that parent can sue for $250. Boise Mayor McLean said in a statement, I stand firmly with librarians and our community in opposition to the recently passed House Bill 710. Our public libraries are and should be inclusive spaces where individuals from all walks of life can access a wide range of materials. Everyone deserves the opportunity to find books that reflect their experiences and identities. The law goes into effect on July 1st. Today, professional women's soccer team, the Seattle Reign FC, extended Boise native and Centennial High alum Sofia Huerta's contract through 2027. Huerta joined the team back in 2020. The 31-year-old has a number of accolades, including 59 starts and 62 regular season games. She was also called up to play for the United States national team in the World Cup last year. 
Huerta says she's excited to keep playing for the rain. And that's your 411. Well, if you spent any time wandering around the College of Idaho in Caldwell, you've likely seen it, but you might not have known its importance or its connection to the community. For four decades, the Rice House sat vacant, vandalized, home maybe to some pigeons or some squatters. The Victorian style home got its name from its original owner and the original founder of the College of Idaho. John Rice was also a mayor of Caldwell. He was a state lawmaker and a state Supreme Court justice. Rice built a career on both law and order, and now his house, his former house, is set to do the same for a Caldwell neighborhood that just might need it. An overlapped link of zoning crosses on the Caldwell corners of Kimball in Chicago. Just more caution when you're crossing here. Don't be stupid. But it's a residential lot that's grabbing conflicted feelings. It's low budget. It caught on fire the back half about a year ago. And it's been a work in progress for long as neighbors remember. That lot. But Aaron Guilford. Um, well. His sights are set on what to caddy in the corner. It's been empty since I moved in. Been empty since before I moved in. We do need more safety in this area. It's, I've heard gunshots. I've heard a lot of cops run by this place a lot. Like every night, there's always a siren that goes by, and I'm like, I didn't do it. A secondhand fixer upper Victoria looking for a second life. I think I would be uh, revived through Mike Dittenberg. Not truthful if I told you I knew all of the logistics because there's a lot of moving parts, figuratively and literally, to move this in one piece, renovate it, and make it a grand part of our community once again. As you can tell, it's a tall task. This has been added. It's an addition for manager. These two by fours are new standard Carlos Gonzalez, and these are the old ones. The stud walls came standard, but there's still plenty more left to get gutted. Yeah, so it's cool. At removing this this center stairwell. That's just part of a longer list. Oh, yeah, it definitely needs new paint. It's a complete renovation of this house from top to bottom, leading to a clear concise goal. Five apartments in the inside of this building. Making for five new neighbors. Pardon, they're gonna put a historic building in a lot that is not a historic lot. That makes absolutely no sense. There needs to be a, a free residential parking area for those that live in the area so they don't have to worry about their cars getting broken into or hit. A tough take considering errands yet to meet the tenants. Well, I think it's a good thing to do. Help out our first responders. Firefighters, police officers, paramedics. How's that for safety? Now see that, that I can get on board with. And these first responders won't be moving in empty handed. So this is the area that the coffee shop is going to be in. And the caffeine will be it. needed. June 29th. For a massive midnight move in. At midnight, I'm gonna get woken up. Okay, thanks. 
The Caldwell Housing Authority won't start that renovation until they move the house to its new location on Kimball in Chicago. The units will have first preference for first responders, and those units will be kept affordable too, again, according to the, house, the Caldwell Housing Authority. Also, Brian, the coffee shop there too, so it's adding a commercial piece okay. to that lot as well. There's like some units downstairs, some units upstairs, but that center area of the, uh, the property, that's going to be a public coffee shop. So coffee shop and first responders in the same building. Yeah. Okay. That's quite a mix. But as, as the resident there, the neighbor is like, all right, well, I can deal with that. That's better than just moving a house in there for nothing. Oh, he just showed him the picture. He's like, they're putting another one in here. <laughs> like, no, this one will be better, I promise. Yeah. And so you have new we'll neighbors. See. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, so moving an historic home is no easy feat. This one, the one that Andrew was talking about, reminded us of another time someone gave an old house a new life and a new address. 18 years ago, Jim and Monica Walker bought a 100-year-old North End home in Boise for $1. What a deal, you might be thinking. However, there was one condition. They had to move it off the land owned by the church next door, the Cathedral of the Rockies. But unlike the two-mile move for the Rice House in Caldwell, the Walker House, a mostly stone structure, only had to go a city block or less than that. Isabel Bilbao has the story from March 2006 in today's 208 redial. Go. Go, Randy. The project started here Monday afternoon at the corner of 4 and 12th Street, where this North End home has been standing for more than a century. Let's go a little bit more. With Kenny Pfeiffer in charge, his family helped hoist this historical home off its foundation. Hey, everybody, clear out of here. Crews worked through the rain as owner Jim Walker watched with anticipation. Inch by inch, the home would make its way across this empty lot by the end of the day. Tuesday morning, they were ready to move the house across the street to its new location. Oh, this is the way they all go, just real slow like this. Nothing real fast. Yeah, hold it. Hold up. Weighing 210 tons, measuring 42 feet wide and 56 feet long. Let's go a little bit. Kenny says this isn't his biggest project. We moved one down Twin Falls, it was solid rock. Easy, Raymond, easy. Bigger than this one. It weighed more than everything, so. Better hold up. Hold up, Raymond. Still, this house was big enough that Idaho Power needed to cut cables. With the electricity out in surrounding homes, neighbors came to the streets to see the spectacle. Have you been watching for a while? Yes, I have. Yeah, how long? I've been watching every day. Yeah. Waiting to see what happens? Yes. Oh, 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 hold it. Like this delay, when the wheels fell off the wooden tracks. But what seemed like a potential disaster was all in a day's work for Kenny and his crew. Just another job. <laughs> That's all it is, just another job. <laughs> Every time something goes, some noise or something goes ajar, something, you know, the, the dollies turn in some way that I don't think they should. And I look over at him and I see his, you know, the same stoic face he's had through this whole uh, operation, and I know that it's okay. Jim admits people have asked if this is all worth it. It does take some rose-colored glasses. A lot of people look at it and say, God, you're an idiot. But for he and his wife, this home is everything they wanted. I knew when I walked into it, it was just it was something about it. I, I, I loved the house, and so did my wife. And, and knowing there would be months of remodeling before they can move in. Between my co-workers and myself, we'll get it done. Jim and his family are in no hurry now. Well, you can't be in no big hurry on something like this. <laughs> Can you? In Boise. Let's go another six, eight inches, he says. Isabel Bilbao, Idaho's News Channel 7. Well, that house, the Walker House, had been vacant for 13 years before the Walkers moved it. Well, Kenny and his family of Western States Movers actually moved it, and they had the house in its new home several hours later. Walkers had plans to call it their new home that summer. A 100-year-old, 210-ton home just moved about a block, and guess what? It still stands today on the corner of 12th and Hay Streets, Catter Corner, that is, to where it once was. We knocked on the door today, but nobody answered this afternoon. There's also a bit more history attached to this house than we probably realized at the time. It was built in 1905 on part of Boise's original town site. It was designed by the famous Boise architect, J.E. Tortolot, the same man who designed and was working on building the state capitol at the same time. The sandstone came from the same Table Rock quarry as the Capitol building as well. And apparently, the home had the first residential elevator in it. The basement had some sort of aviary in it. And the rumor is Harry Orchard would stop by to tend to the birds that were in there. The same Harry Orchard who was serving time at the state pen just up the road for the assassination of former Idaho Governor Frank Stunenberg.
The home is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Entering that time frame of spring where we're starting to see lots of flowers bloom. We've got blue skies in some areas and also a springtime sight you can see from this camera is the snow continuing to recede in some places. So that's what's going on at Sun Valley as those temperatures are near 60 degrees in Haley. And you can see other valley locations also in the 70s and in the 50s and other mountain spots. And you can see low 70s over in the Magic Valley. So these warm temperatures will be sticking around for the next 20 24 hours or so a little bit later than that more so towards Saturday warm temperatures but we do have some changes tonight we could see some isolated showers in the overnight hours but then we see more changes start to take place on Friday in the afternoon and evening we're expecting scattered thunderstorms and some of those storms could be a little on the stronger side the storm prediction center now highlighting highlighting the western parts of the state just noting that we could see stronger storms pop up in that area because of the ingredients that are coming together. And so you can see some of the clouds increasing in areas now ahead of the larger storm system. Some of that rain making it on shore in association with that low pressure center off the coast. That low pressure will continue to dive south really quickly off the coast of California. So that's what will be spurring some of these changes that we will be seeing. These are the isolated showers I mentioned in the overnight hours. And you can see as we go forward to the morning, we could see an isolated shower through Magic Valley spots as well ahead of the afternoon thunderstorm. So right around that 3, 4 p.m. time frame, we'll start to see some of those pop up. And we are looking to see some of those 
reach the mountain areas as well. McCall looks to see a few of those as well, but the trend over the past 24 hours is that we see a fewer that we see fewer thunderstorms. So that's what we're looking at for the latest update. But you can see those temperatures still on the warmer side and some of those storms could be on the stronger side as well. All right, final moments on this Thursday. Some comments you sent in today. We got a lot like this one uh, yesterday during the story. We talked about how Governor Little signed the library bill to wrap up the session yesterday. In regards to the library issue, a lot of current office holders will not get my vote for re-election, including Governor Little. There is a primary coming up in May, election in November. However, not for Governor Little. Not, not this time around. Thanks for sharing the journey of the beautiful Walker home. I'm so glad it was saved, says Diane in Meridian. Meanwhile, Dan, who said he walks by it every day, says... Too bad the block across the street is just still a weed patch. Well, there's a parking lot there, but it's also like a community garden for, I believe, the Cathedral of the Rockies. So maybe they'll kind of tend to it as the warm weather kind of sets in. We'll see you tomorrow.